the privilege of being able to speak to you from God's Word. When our Lord came to this earth, you know, He came for one purpose and one purpose only. He talked about that in the book of Matthew when He said to His disciples on that occasion that just as the Son of Man did not come to this world to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. And so Jesus took every advantage and every opportunity he had to teach people about God and be able to bring them unto Christ. On one occasion, Matthew chapter 5 begins by saying, When Jesus saw the multitudes, he went up unto the mountain. And when his disciples came to him, he sat down and opened his mouth and taught them. Sometimes we talk about the Sermon on the Mount. It was really, truly one of the greatest sermons that had ever been preached. Uh, the greatest sermons ever been recorded. And yet, really, it's not really a, a sermon. The Bible doesn't talk about Jesus preaching to them. It just says simply, He opened His mouth and He taught them. But He was taking advantage of that opportunity. There was another time recorded for us in Luke chapter 5, at verse 3. Jesus is there by the lake Gennesaret, and His disciples are there with Him, and others have come to hear the Word of God. And the Bible says that Jesus got into one of the boats, the one that belonged to Peter, and asked him to put out a little bit from the shore, and he did so, and then again, Peter began, or Jesus began teaching them out of the boat. We're not told on that occasion what he taught about, what the lesson was that he gave to them. But there was an opportunity when he saw this multitude that, there, that he took advantage of that opportunity to be able to speak to them. But of all the times that God ever took that opportunity, that Christ here as God on earth, that ever he took opportunity to teach man, was there on the cross. Seven different times while on the cross, Jesus was going to speak. Now, none of the uh, different gospel accounts contain all seven of the sayings, and so there's some confusion as to the order maybe in which they were given. But all are in agreement that the first words that Jesus spoke there on the cross were those words we had, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus came to provide redemption. And that's why He's there on the cross. His willingness to give His life for all mankind. The first words that He spoke were spoken about that regard. Brother Burton Kaufman made the statement one time. He said the chief business of the cross was forgiveness. And Christ moved quickly to get on with it. He came for that purpose of dying that men might be redeemed. And now that He's in that process of dying there on the cross, He quickly got with this idea. And he prays to his Father, Father, forgive them. And so as we look at this, there are three different things I want to notice in our lesson tonight about this. Number one, the words that he spoke here was a prayer to his Father. Now that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone who's a student of the Bible. Those of you who've read through the New Testament, those of you who've studied about the life of Christ, would not be surprised about this. Because simply the fact that Jesus was a man who always prayed in life. He was constantly in prayer to His Father. The Bible doesn't give us everything about His life. We understand that. The Gospel accounts that are given deal primarily with the last three years of His life, the times of His ministry. But in reality, of those last three years, most of what we have recorded for us deals with the last week of His life. And so we don't have a whole lot being told us about the life of Jesus. We have the instance of when He's born. We have the instance when He's 12 years old. But what we have mostly is toward the end of his life. But even so, in that short amount of time we have given to us about his life and what he did, it is amazing to me how over and over and over again you see the Bible talking about Jesus praying to his Father. One example, Luke chapter 5 and verse 16, says so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. When Jesus prayed, he, he liked to be able to get off by himself to pray to God. And I can understand why he would want to do that. You know, not to be distracted by others. There was always multitudes coming to him, seeking some help from him. And, and he needed that time to be alone to pray to his Father. And so he would withdraw to the wilderness by himself. Jesus had taught his disciples, when you pray, don't pray on the street corners like some were doing, but rather, he says, enter in to your closet and pray to your Father in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And so he, he withdraws to pray. But notice, if you would, that one little word that's of great importance. The text says, so he himself 
often withdrew. Jesus was not just an occasional prayer. He didn't just speak to God sometimes in His life. This was something that was a regular part of His life, that He was often withdrawing in order that He might have that time to speak to His Father, to pray to His Father. And so, we're not surprised by that. We see that in His life over and over again. There are other people that are not surprised to, to know that Jesus is praying here on the cross because they understand, well, isn't that what we do when we're in trouble? That, that if no other time in our life, we're, we're going to go to God when we're having trouble in our life. We want to talk to God. We want God's help in it. And so they say, I can understand why that's happening here. That's what He's doing. You know, the old saying that you've heard, I know, that says, there are no atheists in a foxhole. And the idea being that a person may not believe in God, may not be serving God, may not be caring about God, but put him in a situation where he feels his life is in danger. Where all around him he sees other people being destroyed, and he knows it could happen to him. It's only natural. He's going to go to God in prayer. Well, Jesus, his life is in danger. His life is being taken from him. He is nailed to a cross. So some people say, well, I'm not surprised that he would pray to God. That's what any person would do in a situation like that. And I suppose that's true. I suppose that would be true with any of us. If, if our life was in danger, we'd go to God in prayer, and, and perhaps more than any other time in our life, we would be sincere and earnest in that prayer we would offer up to God. But there's one thing about His prayer that does catch our attention. There is one thing maybe that surprises some people about the prayer that He offers on this occasion. And that is that Jesus here on this occasion is not praying for Himself. He's the one that's suffering. He's the one whose life is being taken from Him. But He doesn't pray to God for Himself. But neither does He pray for His family. His mother Mary is there. And you know she's going through great anguish watching her son hanging upon that cross. But at that time, he's not praying for Mary. Jesus has a number of siblings, brothers and sisters, but they don't believe on him at this time. They're, they're not convinced he's Messiah. In fact, there are indications given to the Bible that, that they believe that Jesus maybe was insane with the claims that he was making. They didn't believe it. But he doesn't pray for them. They're the ones whose very souls are in danger. But He's not offering up a prayer to God on their behalf. He's not even praying for His closest friends, His disciples. Peter, James, and John, who, who comprised that inner circle that Jesus had, who went with Him on special occasions. They were extremely close to Him. But He's not praying for them. Well, who's He praying for? He's praying for His enemies. And that's what surprises so many people. In a situation like that, how would you expect him to be praying for those who are his enemies? But that's exactly what Jesus is doing on this occasion. But again, if you really stop and think about it, you shouldn't be surprised by that. He has spent his entire life concerned about those people who are enemies of God. Those individuals who because of their sins have separated themselves from God and whose very souls are in danger and eternal destruction. He wept over the city of Jerusalem because he knew they had rebelled against him and would not accept him. And he knew what was going to happen to them. And he had spent his entire three years of his ministry trying to bring those people back unto God to get them to come back and doing what God wanted them to do. And so he's praying even for those who are his enemies. But that's the way he lived. He prayed for his enemies. Brother Jimmy Allen spoke one time in a lesson in which he was talking about death and talking about how people died in life. And he said that he had to preach a sermon one time of a man who died cursing God. A, a man who had gotten into a, a brawl and in, in, evidently in a bar room and had threatened somebody and stood in the doorway and said, you're not leaving. And, and the man struck him down to the ground and as the man is dying and he steps over to go out, the man that's dying begins to curse him. And Jimmy Allen said, I had to preach that sermon. How do you preach a sermon like that? Well, that man was simply dying in keeping with how he had lived his life. That's the way it is. We generally speak, we're going to die according to how we've lived in life. William Barclay told about a man who had become very famous in the restaurant business.
had a very successful business in it. But when the time came that he was on his deathbed, and his family has gathered around him, and he speaks directly to his son, who's going to be taking over that restaurant business. And here are the last words that he said to his son. Remember, always cut the meat thin. Well, well, that's the way he had lived. That's the way he had practiced his business. The thinner you cut the meat, the more servings that you get out of it, and the more servings you have, the more money you're going to make. Now, it wasn't necessary that he was an evil man thinking that way, but that's the way he had lived, and that's the way he died. Generally speaking, we're going to die in keeping with how we've lived. And so the fact that Jesus dies here on the cross and he's praying for his enemies shouldn't be a surprise because that's the way he's lived his life. His concern is for those who are his enemies, those who needed salvation. And he's been calling those people back to God and he's dying on the cross for that very reason, that they might be brought back unto God. The second thing I want us to notice about his death here is that he's praying that God would forgive his enemies. In other words, Jesus was praying for that which was best for them. Well, who are these enemies he's praying for? Well, some have suggested that, that surely he's praying for those Roman soldiers. When you think about it, Jesus has been tried in a Roman courtroom, judged by a Roman governor, Pilate, and the execution has been carried out by those Roman soldiers who nailed him to the cross and who stand there watching until he dies. And so surely those are the people that he's praying for. He's praying for his enemies, those people who have actually nailed him to that cross. But he's also praying, I'm convinced, for those Jewish people who have resisted uh, him and, and have not been obedient to him in life. Yes, I know Jesus is, is judged in a Roman court, but when he stood there before Pilate, you know, there were those Jewish rulers that were there, the Jewish leaders that were there to condemn him. And Pilate had actually tried three different times to release Jesus, to let him go free. And on that last occasion, Pilate reminded the Jews that they had a custom, that at that feast day, that they would have him to release one prisoner. So Pilate put forth two men, Jesus and a man by the name of Barabbas. And the Bible tells us that Barabbas had been tried as an insurrectionist and had been guilty of murder. And probably Pilate's thinking to himself, nobody, absolutely nobody would want a murderer turned loose upon them again. And so they're not going to ask for Barabbas to be released. They're going to ask that Jesus be released. And so I can see to it that this man whom I convinced is innocent can be set free. But to his surprise, the people cried out to release Barabbas. And Pilate said, Then what do I do with your king? And their reply was, Crucify him, crucify him, they shouted out. And, and so Pilate gave him over then to be scourged, hoping maybe after he is beaten as severely as he was in, in a scourging, and he brings Jesus out that last time and he says to them, Behold the man. He looked at Jesus that time and saw how badly he had been beaten. Maybe these Jews would be moved with emotion to think this man suffered enough. We're satisfied now with what's been done to him. Let him go, but they don't. They want Barabbas released. So, so Pilate, allows Barabbas to be set free. And he hands Jesus over to be crucified. So I'm sure that, that when Jesus prays here, he has in mind those Roman soldiers and the Roman governor. But also he has in mind these Jewish people who have cried out for his crucifixion. And they are the ones who have, in essence, forced Pilate to give that sentence against him. But in doing that, Jesus here praying for his enemies on the cross is fulfilling prophecy. Isaiah chapter 53, the great chapter in the Old Testament about the suffering servant. In verse 12, we read this passage. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, 
and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He made intercession for those who were guilty of sin. He was interceding on their behalf when he prays to God, forgive them. So prophecy is being fulfilled here in this event as Jesus prays for them. Well, why? Why in the world would you even ask that God would forgive them? Well, Jesus says, for they do not know what they do. Ignorance. Well, I understand. I'm sure you understand. Ignorance is no excuse. Uh, We recognize that in our world today, that ignorance is no excuse. Many, many, many years ago, when I went to get my driver's license, at that time you had to drive in downtown Birmingham. You pulled up in your car, they checked the car out, police officer got in the car with you, told you to pull away, and he told you what to do as you drove around. I had to parallel park and all of that, you know. But it's in downtown Birmingham, and I was scared to death. And, and he never said anything except when he would give me instructions, make a right turn here, pull over, parallel park here. Never said anything other than that until we got back and I parked. And he looked over at me and he said, Son, what's the speed limit in downtown Birmingham? I had no idea. So I said what I'd been doing, 35 miles an hour. He looked at me, and I've never seen such anger on anyone's face in all my life. And he said, if you can find me any speed limit sign in downtown Birmingham that says 35 miles an hour, I will personally go up and get your license for you. Well, I'd been doing 35 miles an hour. And I'd been speeding the whole time, and he never said a thing about it until we got to the end. <laughs> Guess what happened? I didn't get my license. I failed the test. And I had to come back the next day and go again. But I knew, I knew to drive a lot slower than what I'd been doing. Ignorance is no excuse. And yet, sometimes, God recognizes that ignorance can play into why people do what they do. And there's some leniency given. And and it's that way over and over again with with the death of Christ. In Acts chapter 3, Peter's second sermon uh, to the Jewish people, and he says to them, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. When you put Jesus to death, you did it in ignorance. Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul says, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They crucified him because of ignorance. They did not know, and so they put him to death. But what did Jesus mean by that? They didn't know. Surely some of them knew. We we know that Pilate knew that he was putting to death an innocent man. Uh, he, he was convinced of that through the whole trial. And his own wife had sent word to him, said, have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things because of him in a dream. And, and finally, Pilate just gave up, and he, and he took a, a basin of water, and he began to wash his hands, saying, I am free of the blood of this just man. He understood that they were putting to death an innocent man, and he didn't want to have any part in that. But then also Judas knew, didn't he? Judas took took the 30 pieces of silver that he had gotten for betraying Christ, and he took it back to the temple, and he threw those 30 pieces of silver down, and he told the people that he had been guilty of betraying innocent blood. He knew. He knew. So what did Jesus mean when he said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. I believe that it must have been simply, they simply did not know how horrendous the act was that they were involved in. They did not understand. It's not just that I'm putting to death some innocent person, but I'm putting to death the one who is the Messiah. I'm putting to death the one who's the very Son of God. He is God among us in the flesh. And they didn't know that. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 13 The Apostle Paul had talked about his life as being one, as a a blasphemer and a persecutor 
an insolent person, someone who inflicted pain upon those Christians just for the joy he got of it. And yet Paul says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He didn't understand that Jesus really was the Son of God. Acts chapter 7, verses 59 and 60. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He prayed like Jesus did. Don't charge them with the sin. And maybe again, maybe Stephen understand they just don't understand what they're doing. They think they're doing right. They think they're putting to death someone who's guilty. But he's not. There's ignorance involved in what they're doing. And so Jesus prays that God would forgive them. Now here's the key to it, I think. In praying for their forgiveness, Jesus was praying for that which was best for them. And that ties in when we talk about the love that Christ has for all mankind. Because I discussed in my Bible class this morning, and studying there in 2 Timothy, uh, when it talks about love, agape love. And, and how that word is defined by Vine, as well as many other scholars, as, as seeking that which is best for the individual. Vine says of this word agape, it is not an impulse from the feelings that a person has. It's not the kind of love because you look at someone and say, you know, I have good feelings toward that person. But Vine says, love seeks the welfare of all. It's seeking that which is best for the other person. So when Jesus prayed to God that He would forgive them, He was asking that which was best for them. It was the thing they needed more than anything else in the world. They needed God's forgiveness. And not only are they going to be forgiven of their sins when they obey God, but they'll have fellowship with God restored. And they can be with God. And what a blessing that would be. Because God is going to receive them back. And as the Bible had prophesied and has brought forth the New Testament, their sins and iniquity, God says, I will remember no more. That's Jeremiah chapter 31, 34b. So God's going to treat them as if they had never sinned. Forgive them. And God, when He forgives, is going to wipe those sins away and He's never going to bring it up against them again. He's going to treat them as if they had never committed a single sin in their life. Toward the end of the Civil War, when it became clear that the South was going to be defeated, the North would be victorious, a group of reporters met with President Lincoln to talk with him about what's going to be done at the end of the war. And the question they raised was, what are you going to do to those rebellious states. You know, they, they were looking for something, some kind of punishment worthy of the crime. Because of what they've done, they thought, you know, we, we've enveloped our country into a civil war. There have been thousands of people. In fact, more Americans died in the civil war than any other war we've ever been involved in. Thousands of Americans have been killed because of it. Now, what are you going to do to these states? And Lincoln, who'd always talked about having malice toward none, but charity toward all, told those reporters, I shall treat them as if they had never been away. That's the way God does with us. When God forgives the sins, He treats us as if we've never been away. He treats us as if we had never sinned against Him. And that's what Jesus is praying for. Forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. They don't understand who they're killing and the horrendous of their sins. But if they're forgiven, they can be restored again to God and be treated by God as if they had never sinned. And then the final thing, they would be forgiven when they obeyed God's will. Brother Burton Kaufman, commenting on this, said it may not be supposed that Jesus' prayer for the forgiveness of the soldiers who crucified Him implied their immediate forgiveness in heaven. Jesus, he says, as a man forgave them, but the matter of their eternal forgiveness was still contingent upon their faith and acceptance of the terms of the gospel. You know, they, they crucified Jesus because of ignorance. They didn't understand who He was. But when they come to understand who He is, when they are taught the truth, then that truth will cause them to believe in Jesus. He really is who He claimed to be. He's the Messiah. And believing that, they would repent of their sins and they would become obedient to God and being baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Again, you look back to Acts chapter 2, 
the day of Pentecost, the first gospel sermon being preached, and, and Peter says to them, him, talking about Christ, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. He makes the same point again as he draws his lesson to an end in Acts 2.36 and says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so verse 37 says, They cried out, saying, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, they're convinced now. They believe Jesus is who he claimed to be. And they're convinced they've been guilty of putting him to death. And so, well, what do we have to do? And so Peter tells them in verse 38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just a few verses later, verse 41, the text tells us that those who gladly received His word were baptized, and that day there was added about 3,000 souls unto them. When those people became aware of what they'd done, when they were no longer ignorant of the sin they committed, and knew they had put to death God's own Son. When they were convinced of that, they came to believe in Him, they repented of their sins, and they were baptized. Saul had realized that in Acts twenty two sixteen, when Saul himself was told, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The Jews at the gate beautiful in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 had been told, Repent therefore and be converted. And your, that your sins may be blotted out, so the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And you go on through the book of Acts, and you see it over and over and over again, in all the instances. When people are brought to faith in Christ, to understand who He is, that's when they make the change, that they become obedient to God, and they can have their sins forgiven. Now the question this morning, where do you stand in regard to your relationship to Christ? Are there any here this morning who've never become His children because of your, your lack of faith, maybe, or maybe you believe, but you haven't allowed that belief to lead you to make the change in life, to, to repent of your sins, to confess Christ as God's Son, to understand that's who He is, and to be buried with Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of sins? Or maybe there are those here who are children of God, and yet you know you haven't really been living for God the way you should. You, you, you profess faith in Him, you've been baptized into Christ, but you're st still not living that life of faith. And you need to correct that. You need to repent of your sins and pray to God for the forgiveness you need. And God's promise that He will forgive. So as we think about the prayer that Jesus made on that occasion, a prayer that He made for His enemies, those who were opposed to Him, that uh, they would be forgiven. Forgive them for they know not what they do. We're not in that ignorance this morning. We know. We know who Christ is. Will we not then be obedient to Him to make our lives right with Him? If you in any way need to respond in obedience to the will of God, we encourage you to do that now while we stand and while we sing.